Today I want to talk to you about prophetic words about Jesus, Yeshua, uh, why the Lord gave seven prophetic words. We find them in the Gospel of Matthew, and then in the Gospel of Luke, in the first couple of chapters of both of those books. But God, what prophecy is, give you a short definition of prophecy. Prophecy is God speaking to us in humankind and telling us something that is going to happen in the future for us and to help us. And God gave the announcement of the birth of the Savior, the Messiah, in advance. And actually, the scripture I read to you from Isaiah 9 this morning, that was Isaiah lived 700 years before Jesus Christ was ever made a human being and lived and walked on planet Earth. So that prophecy in Isaiah 9, was a prophetic word that God gave the people of that time, Israel of that time, declaring to them that a Savior would come, that the government would rest upon his shoulder, that he'd be the mighty God, that his, he would be the Prince of Peace, and his government would have no end but an everlasting government. That's prophecy that God foretold that. So we see uh, the first, first part that I preached about this a couple of weeks ago, that we saw the first three words that talked about salvation, favor, and blessing. And today we'll talk about the other four prophetic words. I'd like to thank Pastor J.R. for a tremendous message he preached last week, two young people were saved, came to the knowledge of the Lord during that service. So thank you for a powerful word and worship that they brought forth. They always bring forth a, an anointing and a gifting. Amen. So here we go. Uh, I've already said that. The fourth word that we're looking at today uh, about the prophetic birth of Jesus Christ is guidance. And in guidance, we look at the life of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary or a spouse to them, engaged to them. And I think you probably already know this, but at that time, and this is what being engaged today is really supposed to say also, but in that day, when you were a spouse or engaged to somebody, you were as good as if you were already married. It was done. You just did not consummate it physically yet. That was the last remaining act to do, but it was a very serious commitment to uh, one another, and so Joseph finds himself in that situation. Uh, we saw in the other uh, prophecies that uh, Mary was favored by the Lord and handpicked by the Lord to have the Christ child, but Joseph was in a dilemma. Here he was espoused to her, engaged to her, and it appeared that she'd been unfaithful to both the Lord, her family, and Joseph. He's in a mess. What do I do with this girl, which Mary was probably about the age of 14 years old. They married very young in that day. Aren't you glad that most of our daughters wait a little while today? Some of us are glad. Some of us said, no, I'd really like to get her out of the house as soon as I can. <laughs> no, you don't think that. <laughs> But so Joseph finds himself in this dilemma, and, and so he's meditating, what am I supposed to do? Mary's deserving of death if she's been unfaithful. She's going to be a scandal in the, neighbor, in the community, and I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm ashamed. She's been unfaithful to me. The other guys, my friends are going to look up, like, yeah, Joseph, she found somebody else. She two-timed. Yeah, all of that was wrapped up into his thinking. He was a man. He was a human being. So here's Joseph. He's contemplating, meditating what am I going to do? And the scriptures say in Matthew 119, Joseph being her husband, see, it already called her, called him the husband. They were a spouse as good as married. He, but he was a just man, meaning he was a righteous man, a godly man, a pious man, not wanting to make a public example out of Mary because he loved her. He respected her, didn't want to embarrass her, didn't want to shame her. But yet this was not good. So he sought for a way to put her away secretly or privately. But while he was meditating upon these thoughts, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid, don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed to take Mary, uh, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, the reality of this, they'd never had, they'd never seen, they'd never heard of anything like this happening. This was a first. And here they were, two young people, wondering, what is going on? How can this be? Mary said, how can this be that I've not known a man? Of course, the angel reassured her that which is in you is conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he says that same mes message to Joseph. That which is in her. It's not some other guy. She doesn't slip around on you. This is conceived of the Holy Spirit. So God gave to Joseph by an angel through a dream guidance. Thank the Lord for guidance from the Lord. And that was one, that's one of the prophetic words about the birth of Jesus, that God would guide not only Joseph and Mary, but God would guide our lives. 
Uh, no matter what situation we're in. God does, I don't know what your theology allows for you to believe in, but if you'll read the Bible all through both the Old and the New Covenant, God appeared to people in dreams. God appeared to people with angelic visitations. That's not weird. That's normal in the, in the life of the person that's a God-fearer and one that knows God. That's normal. Uh, I'm not saying you should have maybe a dream every night, you know, about something from the Lord. Uh, some of our dreams are really goofy. I'm glad, I'm glad those goofy ones aren't God. And uh, some of them, some of them are, are bad food dreams or, or just from our subconscious, you know, something weird and things get really crossed up in our dreams. We're married to the wrong person and there stands our real wife. And how do you explain that? Don't act like you don't have weird dreams now. But then, you know, so all dreams aren't from the Lord, but yet at the same time, the Lord does speak to us through dreams. The Lord still does allow angels to appear to people. That's why it says in Hebrews, be careful who you entertain because you could be entertaining an angel not knowing it. Be careful of strangers that come across your path. And so those aren't just fruit loop, freaky kind of strange stories. Those are real events that can still happen to us today. Okay, so there's Joseph and Mary pondering what to do. The Holy Spirit, the Lord speaks to Joseph through a dream. So here Jesus is born. So they meditate, of course, they make the trek to, to you know, to, to, to Bethlehem where he's born. They're contemplating to go back home. He's born, he's traveling, you know, they can travel back, so they're going to go back home. So they're, they're contemplating going back home. Another angelic appearance in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 13. Now when they departed, behold, they were on their way back to Nazareth. Now, when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, well, how? In a dream, an angel in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. Man, the Lord was just revealing himself to them. Until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Well, we know the story of that. Herod killed all the children two years old and younger in hopes of wiping out this Messiah that was supposed to come and become Lord and take his place. Then verse 19 said, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared, and I'm going to say again, this is third time, to Joseph in a dream, saying, arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life, they're dead. Then he arose, and he took the young child and his mother, and he came into the land of Israel. So we, we see that th the third time that through this process of dreams and gel angels uh, revealing themselves, they revealed God's will and God's plan, God's safety net, God's plan of provision for them. The, then in verse 22 of Matthew chapter 2, when Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of the, his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Now Joseph was sensing something, not all is still well yet. We can't return home. But here it is again. And then being warned by God in a dream. This is the fourth time. Warned of God in a dream, he turned aside to the region of Galilee. And he went and they lived in a city called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets that Jesus shall be called a Nazarene. These were amazing visitations and amazing words from the Lord that prove that God guides them. Now, we're sitting here today probably thinking, well, that was them, and they were special, and they were called out, you know, the birth of Christ's child and birth Yeshua, Yeshua. They were special people, and God doesn't do that for everybody. But the point of this and, and the why the Lord had this in here, God wants you to know he will guide your life. And he has a purpose and he has a plan for your life. Just as important that he did, had for Joseph and for Mary, God's plans for your life are just as important as God's plans for their life. And God is able to guide us through either prophetic words or dreams or revelation or through the word of God, the Bible, or through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is able to speak to you and guide you. So for us today, we don't have to worry we don't have to be upset. We don't have to live life in anxiety because Jesus came. That's why God sent him. Jesus came to guide us either through a dream, warning, revelations, angels, whatever the Lord has to use, however God can speak to you and get through to you. The Lord understands how you work, how you think. The Lord will speak to you in a way that can bring you to the knowledge of him. It's amazing. 
He doesn't deal with us all the same because we don't all think the same. We don't all process the th- things the same way. But how God knows he can speak to you, he will reveal himself to you if you will be hungry and let the Lord do that. The Lord will tell you which job to take or not to take. The job may look great. It may sound good. It, the benefits may be better than you've had before. But there may be something there that the Lord knows about that job that if you took it, it would mess you up. And the Lord may speak to you and say, even though it all looks great and all looks wonderful, you don't have a peace. And I want to tell you one of the ruling things in your life, if you don't have peace about something, don't do it. If you can't have peace in your heart, no matter how good it looks, no matter how good he or she looks, don't do it. Don't get hooked up with them. Don't get emotionally involved in them. Because when your emotions, I'm meddling now, I'm doing the preaching marriage thing now. When, when you get emotionally involved to them and attached to them, it's hard to unhook from them. And you'll go, your emotions will lead you further than your brain. You, your brain kind of shuts off and your emotions kick in. I don't want you to raise your hands. I don't want to know about it. But that happens. People get emotionally connected with people and they're, they're, they're unequally yoked. But the Holy Spirit will tell you. He'll tell you what job to take or not to take. He'll tell you where to move, what city to move in, what, what position to take. He'll tell you which school district to go with, send your kids with. The Lord came. Jesus came to offer guidance for our lives is what the Lord wants us to understand. And he still speaks to us through his Holy Spirit and his word. I didn't say it in the first service, but Jesus said the role and the ministry of the Holy Spirit Jesus said, when I go back to the Father, I'm going to pray to the Father, and he'll send another comforter. When this other comforter comes, he will lead you, he will guide you into all truth. When you want truth and you have a heart that's seeking truth, you are like a magnet to the Holy Spirit. He will draw himself to you and lead you and guide you. You may be in great darkness. You may be in great ignorance. You may be in great misunderstanding about your life or your future or situation or decision. But if you'll have a heart that's seeking after truth, the Lord will find you and he'll lead you in the right way if you're hungry for him to do that. Thank God for his mercy and his goodness and his grace. The next word that God used as a prophetic word about Yeshua, Jesus coming, was the word joy. Anybody need some more joy today? Jesus said, I give you joy not as the world gives you, and, you know, don't let the joy be taken away from you. Don't let the world take your joy away from you. Jesus has given us joy. In Luke 2, it says, now, this is about the shepherds. Now, in the same, we're in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. See, there it is again, angels of the Lord coming to reveal uh, the message of, of the Lord's goodness to people. The angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. You would be too. We'd all be. Then the angel said to them, don't be afraid. You know how many times that's said in Scripture by Jesus and angels to human beings? Don't be afraid. Many, many, many times. Don't be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. You know, God's will is still that there be peace on earth and goodwill towards all men. That's God's desire for you. God didn't come to curse you. God didn't come to to do something evil towards you when when bad, difficult things happen in, in life. It's not God doing that to you. We live in a sin cursed world world that is manipulated by the prince and the power of the air and demonic influences that are trying to steal, kill, and destroy and keep every one of us from fulfilling and walking in the destiny that God has for us. Listen, it's called warfare. There's a warfare between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness over which the enemy and his dominions rule in. But Jesus has come to give us joy. And in the context of this message here in this scripture here today, the joy was a cause uh, for the reason. And Jesus is still the reason for the season. So without Jesus in your season, you really can't have joy. Oh, you can get a gift and you can have fun and you can do all the temporary stuff. You can get new presents, new clothes, new car, new house, new baby, new, new wife, new husband, new boyfriend, new girlfriend. You can have a lot of things new, but the real reason for joy is when Jesus Christ comes into your heart. Jesus or joy is different from happiness. Happiness is based on what happens to you. 
Joy is based on the gift of God that he gave through his son who came to be your savior and your Lord. He gave us joy. Joy is having a right relationship with him. When you get connected with Jesus, and that's a good thing when you get connected with Jesus. When you get connected with Jesus, one of the fruit of the spirit is joy along with love, peace, and temperance and self-control and the other fruit there. It's joy. And so the, the byproduct of you knowing the Lord Jesus is joy. Now, we're all aware of Satan when Satan attacks, and Satan never lets up, does he? He never stops. Even when you're down, even when, even when you feel like you're at the, your lowest, the enemy is always there trying to just finish you off and do you in. And he attacks even during tragedy. There are times when a family is going through the worst of times and loss, and either someone's missing out of the family, or there's somebody that's wayward in rebellion, and our hearts are broken. Does the devil stop and say, oh, they're going through a bad time. Let me ease off on them. No, he constantly is attacking. But here's the truth for you and I, and here's the truth for a child of God. If you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're hearing this today, here is the difference in a Christian's life and the life of a person who doesn't know the Lord yet. Christians are not exempt from the troubles of this world. You just heard two brothers testify today. They had serious illnesses. They walked in the valley of the shadow of death. It was, it, it was touching. Ray could not be around anybody. He could not uh, go anywhere. Uh, when he finally got to where he could go out, he had to wear a mask. And if you came to see him, you had to wear a mask. Any kind of infection, anything could end up killing him. Dave was touch and go with the infections and everything else like that, just a battle. You, fate, you just heard the story of two men that walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Christians aren't immune from the stuff of life happening. The difference between us and the person who's not a Christian, we've got a Savior. we got God on our side. We, we're on His side. We've got a God that helps us. God loves, the un, un, God loves the unbeliever, the one that's not a Christian. God loves them, but you don't have any promise of God's help. But when you're a child of God, the much, so, the much more of Romans kick in. If we love God, and now that we love Him, how much more does He provide for us and for those that love the Lord? So I'm going to say this, Christians are the only people in the world who can legitimately grieve and still rejoice at the same time. The world can't do that. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul said that said we, we, uh, when we grieve, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. For the Christian, we always have hope because we have a Savior. We have a God that loves us. And so, you know, don't ever give up on the Lord because he doesn't give up on you. He doesn't give up on your situations. And I would just want to encourage you today, even if the enemy may attack, be attacking you in this season of your life with family or health or sickness or job or whatever it is, marriage or whatever it is, don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't stop hoping in the Lord because God sent his son to give you joy. And joy is different from just happiness. Happiness is dependent upon your circumstances. Joy is dependent upon your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can go through anything and still have joy in your heart when you stay close to the Lord. Amen. We probably need to readjust our perspective and realize that, that money or having the right answers or having all of our problems solved that's not what makes us joyful. Maybe we need to readjust our perspective and realize it's not money or those things that give us joy. And Jesus spoke about that in Luke 12, 15. He gave us, kind of a, he gave us a warning. He said, watch out. Look out, be careful. Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed or desiring things, covetousness in this world, because one's life, a person's life, does not consist in the abundance of the material possessions that they have. That's not your life. You can still, and I know it would be bad, and I know it would be difficult, and there are people like that. You can lose everything in this world, but you have the Lord Jesus. You still have hope, and you can still have joy in the midst of it. So this Christmas season, don't give up your hope in the Lord. You, he came to give you joy, and that is a prophetic word he came to give you is joy. It's a, time to, it, it's a time to be with family and to be with friends and to just experience that goodness of the Lord. I know a lot of people say, a lot of people feel this way. Well, I can't, we can't have Christmas because we don't have any money. Or we got problems. Or I don't have the situations in my life solved and worked out. You know what you're really saying when you say that? 
You're saying that money or perfect circumstances is what you gauge your joy on. Come on, raise the standard. Raise the standard and realize your joy is in the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there is joy forevermore. Not temporary, but forevermore. So don't gauge your joy and don't gauge your peace and don't gauge your relationship with God or God's love for you based on what you don't have. Remember what you do have through the Lord Jesus Christ and his love. The sixth word of prophecy that the Lord gave us is the word redemption or redeemed. And we see that in the life of Anna the prophetess. Her and Simeon were amazing people. You don't know a lot about from Scripture, but we know a little bit about them. In Luke chapter 2, it says, Now there was one Anna who was a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, who was a tribe of Asher. She was of great age. That's pretty diplomatic to say she's an old woman. Okay, she was of great age. We're going to see in a minute how old she really was or could have been. And she was of great age, and she lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. Now, in that time, girls were typically married around the age of 13, 14, when they reached the age, you know, that they could have children, and they, were, they could be, become a, mom, a wife and a mama. So this woman, Anna, had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. This woman was a widow, though, about 84 years. And after that husband died, she lived 84 years, and she'd never departed from the temple, but she served God with fasting and prayer. It says night and day about her. And, in the, and when Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, brought him to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord, and that's why we do t child and parent dedication here, and we'll have one in January where the, both the parent and the child, they dedicate themselves and that child to the Lord. And so this is what was happening in the life of Jesus, Yeshua, and coming in that very moment, just prophecy collided in that very moment, if you can picture that, and coming in that in instance, Anna gave thanks and saw this baby, Christ child, she gave thanks to the Lord, and she spoke of him, the Lord Jesus, to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. That's what the Jews were looking for, is redemption, salvation. And Anna saw that Christ child come into the temple for that dedication time. And boom, God had that moment when all of that collided. All those prophecies collided together and came together. Now, just a side note, if Anna was married, just say she was married at the age of 14, which was not uncommon, and she lived with her husband for 21 years, and then he passed away, and she was in the temple for 84 years. Anna possibly could have been about 119 years old. Wow. Now, that's not uncommon because Simeon, the next guy we're going to talk about, he was 112 years old. The point is, and here's the point, you're never too old to be ministered to by the Lord and the Lord to give you his fresh revelation. Don't count yourself out. Well, we're old or it's too young. You're never too young. Neither are you ever too old. The Lord will minister and the Lord will reveal himself and give revelation to, who, to those who are hungry and looking for him. God chose these two older people to prophesy about his son. What was the word he gave to Anna? It was redemption. She said, here, this is the one who will come, who we look for redemption for Israel. What does that word redemption mean? It comes from the word redeem. Deem is what you assign value to you. You say, I deem that product or that item to be worth $10.50 to me. I deem it. That means you put value to it. The word re means again, and what that was saying is that you are reclaiming, you're rebuying, you're, you're taking for yourself, and you're rebuying it, you're restoring something, you're paying for it to buy it back. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to buy you back. Jesus paid the price to redeem you, buy you back. The truth of this is God owns us by right of creation. He's the creator. He created the first man and woman. Out of them came all of us. I realize he put into our parents the reproductive process where they can have children, but it's God who owns us in the first part. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, he says, Paul says the question through the Holy Spirit, don't you realize your body that you're not your own, but you belong to the Lord? See, we think we run our own show. We think we call our own shots, but really we're God's. We belong to God by right of creation. But here's the miracle, because mankind fell and sinned against God and rebelled against God, and we try to go our own way, 
and we go our own way and we're breathing when we're eating and we're going through life and we're working and we're bringing home a paycheck and we're, and we're having families and we're doing all that stuff that we call life, but it's, that's not really life. And we're doing all of that stuff, but then God says, you know, it's not enough that you be separated from me. I'm going to buy you back again. And that is the reason Jesus came. I know you know that today, but maybe there's somebody here that doesn't really understand the goodness and the value of what God's done for you. God said, I will not let you live in your fallen state, but I so love you and so care about you and so want you to experience my eternal life and my blessings in your life and my relationship with you that I sent my son. I became a human being in the person of Jesus Christ and he has come to buy you back with his own blood. So number one, God owns you because of his creator. Number two, he owns us and he has a right to us because he redeemed us. He paid the price with his own blood to buy us out of sin and restore us back to the family of God. Amen. Thank God. That's why you and I can rejoice. That's why Christmas has meaning. It's more than the presents. It's more than all the fun. It's more than all the food and all the parties. It's that we can rejoice, say, I am a born again child of God. I'm a son or a daughter. I'm an heir of God. I'm a co-heir, joint heir along with Jesus Christ. If I were to die and drop dead today, I know where I'd be through eternity. It'd be in the presence of the Lord where there is joy forevermore. I know we all don't want to go, and if there's a bus lined up in the curb to take us to heaven right now, probably most of us said, no, I don't want to, not today. I want to go to heaven, but not today. But what a sweet day that will be when it comes our time to go and be with the Lord. Now, one of the greatest examples in the Bible, is in the Bible about redemption is in the story of Hosea. And I think, Pastor J.R., you mentioned Hosea somehow last week. Somebody told me that. I don't have the whole story yet, but anyway, they said you did. But in Hosea 1, this is weird. God will tell you to do some weird things sometimes. But God told Hosea, you're a prophet, and I want you to have a wife. I'm sure Hosea's saying, thank God it's about time. But the Lord said, but here's the catch. I want you to go down to the market on the street, and I want you to purchase a woman as your wife. But she's, there's a little catch to it, Hosea. She's a prostitute. What? God, I thought you wanted me to live holy. And, but she's a prostitute. Hosea, I'm going to use this marriage to be a picture to my people, Israel, of my love for them. So Hosea obeys the Lord. He goes and he, he pays the price for Hosea. He purchases her. She becomes his wife. Her name's Gomer. All I can say is you get what you pay for. Her name's Gomer. They have three children together. After all these kids are born, what does she do? Becomes a faithful mother and a wife. No. After these three kids are born, she doesn't settle down. She, becomes, she goes out and she prostitutes herself again. Breaks, breaks Hosea's heart, and God just comforted and said, Hosea, I'm working in this. I'm going to ask you to do a hard thing, but Hosea, I want you to do something that shows my heart to people. And I want you to go back down there on the street and find Gomer. Find her roaming around. Find her selling herself to different guys. Find herself. She's already been doing it. She's already been with a bunch of other guys already. I want you to find her, Hosea. And I want you to pay a price and buy her back. And I want you to bring her home again. Hosea goes to obey the Lord. And it's a prophetic picture. And it's what God says about you and I. That some of us may never know him that's listening to me today. Some of us may be here that once knew him, that you were once close to him. So, but whether, whether we've left God or never known God or whether we leave God, what the story is, God is passionate. God is passionate about loving us and to the point that he sent his son, Jesus, to redeem us, to buy us back. No matter what it took, he's there to bring you back and to deal with your heart and to keep you close to him. Thank the Lord. Seventh, seventh prophetic word about Jesus Christ coming that is a picture. It's the word that we're all looking for, peace. Peace on earth, goodwill towards man. Was the angel's declaration when the Christ child was born. We're all looking for that peace, peace of mind, peace in our family, peace in our body, whatever kind of peace we are. And it's pictured in the life of Simeon, who was the other prophet. Anna was a prophetess. Simeon is the prophet. Luke 2 says about this, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and pious. In other words, he was a good man, waiting for the consolation, which means the comfort or the peace of Israel. 
And the Holy Spirit was upon this man, Simeon, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that Simeon would not die before he had seen the anointed one of the Lord. So again, there's this colliding of prophetic words in this moment. Anna had the moment when she was there when the Christ child was brought to be dedicated. Simeon was also there when the Christ child was brought to be dedicated by his parents to the Lord. And so, so it says, so Simeon came into the temple and when the parents brought the child Yeshua to do for him according to the custom of the Torah, Simeon received him into his arms. See, for most of the world, they just said, it's just a baby. Just another baby among many on the eighth day going to be, you know, dedicated to the Lord. But Simeon knew something that the rest of the people didn't know. Anna knew something the rest of the people didn't know. By this time, Joseph and certainly Mary knew something about this child the rest of the world did not recognize. And it took him into his arms and offered a a Baruch, a blessing to God saying, now may you let your servant go in peace. O sovereign master, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the nation and to the glory of your people, Israel. You know, a real question today is, have you had the light of the revelation that Yeshua Jesus has come to save you, save the nation, save all the people, but save you personally? He cares for you in a personal way to save you. Not only did the Lord use people who were along in their age, such as Simeon and Anna, he also used people that were young, such as Joseph and Mary. He used uh, three men, Zacharias. Uh, We see the father of John the Baptist. He used Joseph. He used Simeon. And then the Lord used three women. He used Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist, wife to Zacharias. He used Mary, who was the wife of Joseph. And he used Anna. The, the, the prophetess who was uh, now a widow to deliver the prophecies about his son coming to earth. The point is, there's no male or female in Christ. Jesus came to set things right in the world. I, I looked this up this morning to just refresh my memory and, and make sure that I was correct. But every Shabbat, when Zion sake or any other Messianic congregation, when they stand right here in this spot and they light the candles... They light the candle for Shabbat to begin that Shabbat service on Friday night. The woman is the one who does that. And you'll see the woman, she covers herself, her head. And after she lights the candles, she, she waves her hands three times. And she repeats that blessing. You know what's going on? You know what God came to set straight through Jesus? Now, ladies, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. In the garden, it was a woman who Satan came to. It was a woman that first deceived, and of course, Adam fell for it too, okay? But it was a woman who was first deceived and allowed darkness to come in. God is so good to redeem us that now he allows and put in place the woman to call forth the light to come back, the light and the blessing to come back. The light and the blessing is the Lord Yeshua, Jesus Christ. But that's what's going on in that. She's calling forth the light and the blessing to come back in. God is so good. God redeems us. Wherever you've messed up, wherever you've failed, wherever you've stumbled, wherever you've missed the mark, and that's what the real meaning of sin is, wherever you've done it, God so loves you, he sent his son, Yeshua, Jesus, to redeem you, to buy you back, to take you back, to fix what was broken in your life. That is the meaning and the wonder and the miracle of this Christmas season that we celebrate. He had to get here as a babe to grow up to be the Savior that was crucified and then resurrected and that now intercedes for us in him. He had to become the baby. But thank God every day we can celebrate Yeshua Jesus for what he's done for us, his goodness and his mercy and his grace for us. Here's what the Lord is saying to you and I during this Christmas season. Even though you may be going through difficulties, trials, reversals, you can still have peace. You can still have his presence. You can still have his love and his mercy in your life because the Prince of Peace has come. The Prince of Peace has come. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. To cover all seven again.
I pray that the Lord will help you meditate on this. Because of God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And whosoever would choose to believe on him or trust him will have eternal life and salvation in this life and in the life to come eternally. And because of that, we have salvation. We have his favor. We have his blessing. We have his guidance. You're not alone. We have his joy over all circumstances. You can still have joy because Jesus gave you joy. We have redemption. He came to save us and set us free from captivity, blindness, darkness, loneliness, whatever you're experiencing and going through. And then he gave us peace. He gives us peace because he is the Prince of Peace in our life. I'd like for our prayer teams, our ministry teams, if you'd come to the altar area today. And I want to give you an opportunity. Pastor Larry's going to lead us in some type of a little worship course here as we end. But I want to give you an opportunity. If you need peace, if you need that, if you need that redemption, if you need that favor, if you're here today and you're not born again, if you're listening, you're watching online and you're not born again, you've never invited this Prince of Peace, this Lord, this Savior into your life to forgive you and forgive you of your sin. This is a wonderful opportunity for you. Please don't be ashamed or embarrassed. Listen, I've, I walked out of aisle 40. You always have to do the math. I walked out of aisle 48 years ago. I've never regretted getting out of that third row. They had pews then. They're getting out of that third row and coming down that aisle and standing. I've never regretted that day because that's the day that Jesus, I accepted him, I received him, and he washed my sins away. I have joy that nothing in this world could ever replace. You can give me a new car. You can give me a million dollars. It wouldn't even begin to hold up to what the goodness of the Lord has given to me personally. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Do you have trials and tribulations? Yeah. But I'm not alone. I'm not alone. He said, I'll never leave you, fail you, or forsake you. I'll go with you all the way to the end of the world. Today, this season is a wonderful time. If you've never accepted Jesus, all you've got to do is invite him into your heart. Confess to him that you need him, that you're sorry for your sins. You receive him as Lord and Savior. Or if you need healing in your body today, God is not restricted to Brazil to do miracles. The same God, he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same everywhere. He can provide healing for your body today. So we just want to open this altar to you. Whatever your need is, as Pastor Larry leads us in worship, just step out from where you are. The Lord is touching your life. Step out from where you are and allow these to agree with you in prayer. That's what they're here for, not to judge you, not to condemn you, not even to counsel you, but to just agree with you in prayer and to bless you today.